So hi everybody and welcome to uh, Black Lives Matter Pandemics and Poetics. Uh, uh, my name is Tristan Cabello. I am uh, I wear several hats at AAP. Uh, I am the Associate Director of the Master of Liberal Arts. I'm also a senior lecturer and I'm also the co-chair of uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And I'll be juggling between um, uh, different hats uh, uh, today. Um, you can follow me on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. You can also have a look at my website. And you should also feel free to email me if you have any questions about AAP, about the MLA program, or uh, about uh, this event. Uh, but today, tonight, uh, the event is absolutely not about me. It's about welcoming back to campus virtually uh, one of our uh, great alumni. Uh, wow. His name is uh, Edward Doyle uh, Gillespie. And Ed just uh, wrote a book, just published a book a couple of weeks ago uh, with Loyola University, Maryland. It's called Gentrifying the Plague House. It's a book of poetry. And tonight, uh, the event is really about discussing the book, discussing uh, Ed's trajectory, discussing the book, discussing how the book relates to um, the current situation about COVID, Black Lives Matter, because this is a book that was written uh, last year during the COVID epidemic and during uh, the social unrest uh, that we have experienced in, in the US and, and globally. And so uh, if I read the back cover of the book, uh, Ed's bio reads something like this. Um, Ido Gillespie is a Baltimore City police officer, a 15 year veteran of the force. He has worked in patrol operations and education among other specializations. His books of poetry include uh, Masala Tea and Orange Days uh, on the later edition of Sancho Pensa, Socorro Profesi and Aerial Act. He is a former teacher uh, who holds a BA in history from uh, George Washington University and a Master of Liberal Arts from uh, Johns Hopkins University. But when, when you do a quick research in Google on Ed, uh, you find <laughs> out that he's uh, about much more than that. I mean, there's virtually um, uh, dozens of articles um, uh, about Ed uh, online. This is from The World. This is an article from Slate. This is um, uh, an article from Baltimore Magazine. And so, um, Ed is doing a lot, a lot of different things that has been influenced by his time at AAP in the MLA program, but also by his own trajectory. And so uh, after welcoming Ed, uh, I'd like to ask you the first question really here. Uh, uh, and it's really about how do you define yourself? How would you introduce yourself? <laughs> first of all, thank you for that introduction. I seem more accomplished every day. <laughs> thank you. My gosh. Um, Wow, the well defining, you know, defining yourself. It's funny because it kind of goes into I don't want to jump the gun here on some of the things we're going to talk about, but yeah, um, it's always a process, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's part of why I like the MLA so much. There's a, it's a process. It's about you know you're you're multidimensional and um, you, you've got multiple intelligences and you're multidimensional and you've got foibles and fortes and so. You know, I, you've got multiple hats that you wear at the same time in many cases, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm answering your question with more questions, but. <laughs> yeah, but, but this um, is like, in many of the articles that I've read about you, uh, the journalists are describing you as uh, the poet of the Baltimore Police Department. <laughs> and so I find that this is a very, uh, it's a very cute, you know, like nickname, you know, but I think it's very reducing too. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk more about what you do at uh, uh, the police department and sure. also how your work, you know, in at the MLA program has influenced what you do now? Yeah, that's been um, so. 9/11 was supposed to be my first day at the MLA program, mm -hmm. um, so I kind of resolved at that point that I wanted to go into some sort of stewardship, probably law enforcement. When I finished my MLA, I got my black belt to um, mm -hmm. and join the police department. Now, okay. it's interesting because I did a lot of work in um, operational stuff. I was in patrol. I was in um, what's called the, what, a, a, a task force. So we dealt with guns, gangs, drugs, in Pennsylvania Avenue corridor. Mm -hmm. I started dealing with a lot of, a lot of the 
rethinking a lot of the lenses I was given through the and, ML and program. If I just make a trip, like um, uh, a Pennsylvania Avenue corridor, can you explain oh, for sorry, yeah. those of us who are not from the DMV? Sure. So Pennsylvania Avenue is um, one of the major roads that runs through Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of Baltimore, see, this is where my background with my history degree and particularly with the MLA comes into play. You start to see where the city was segregated over time and how this was ultimately neighborhoods that were called out particularly for blacks, for African-Americans. And for a long time, it, it was understood they were not to leave there. Mm -hmm. there. There was a certain parameter that they weren't allowed to leave. It goes through this area, um, down this, this road and uh, for miles. And uh, at one point, the black elite kind of congregated there and there were clubs and you know we're talking Harlem Renaissance time you know yeah. and um, at this point now this is the place where Bernie Sanders said it reminded him of, of, of a developing world country mm -hmm. um, when resources are not put into an area when they an area is marginalized I mean you, you end up with social dis dysfunction and so there's a tremendous amount of uh, narcotics trade gangs and um, violence there got gun violence particularly and i was in a task force to help deal with that um i went in uh in intelligence unit so gathering information on shootings and gangs i did a lot of work with that mm -hmm. and um i did written directives but i finally have made my way to education and, and training so i train i do in-service training for officers that are currently on the street and i train um recruits mm -hmm. Yeah, right. so, and with and in that, I do myriad things. I train them in counterterrorism. I train them in incident response to terrorist bombing. Um, I do a lot of work with bias. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with history and ethics. I love teaching ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, doing... and so in those workshops that you do um, on bias, on ethics, this is where everything that you have, uh, the knowledge that you have accumulated in, in the MLA program, you know, also comes to fruition, right? So this is where, yeah, I love the way it was phrased in the MLA, that what are the ways of knowing? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I love about the MLA, it wasn't just a matter of here's this discipline, we're gonna learn everything we can about this school of thought and this discipline, you're gonna see the world through this lens. Mm -hmm. um, everything had to come from myriad vantage points. Mm -hmm. So when I discuss community policing, when I discuss um, ethics, I've brought in Plato and James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. I've found historical pieces, historical oral histories of police work from around the world. And I've put that together with pop culture. Um, I feel like the MLA kind of gave me license to start feeling around with how I, you've got a central question you have to answer, right? And mm -hmm. you can come at it from all these different angles. And uh, the MLA, I think, really em really empowered me to be able to look from those different angles. And it's it's actually proven useful with my officers. Yep. Yeah, and so uh, for for the members in the audience who don't know what the, the MLA is about, you know, it's, it's so it's, it stands for Master of Liberal Arts. This is one of the programs that we offer here at AAP. And as you said, Ed, it's a, uh, uh, so it's an interdisciplinary program. It's based, you know, in the history of IDs, but we also, you know, um, uh, offer a lot of courses in more contemporary topics in African American studies, in gender studies, in popular culture. Uh, and so the goal is really how can the humanities, the social sciences, the liberal arts, really um, expand, you know, the world that we live in today. And so uh, this is why you you're really a, a good example of how uh, the the master of liberal arts, you know, can 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 be used because. Um, uh, uh, it's not obvious, you know, at first how um, a police officer in Baltimore, you know, could use that knowledge, you know, in training, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But this is what I'm seeing, you know, much more often, you know, among our, our students. We have students in human resources, for example, who are using uh, uh, this type of training. Can you please share maybe a, a, a aha moment that you've had uh, in, in, in your teaching, in your workshop on bias, um, when, you know, somebody has come to you and say, hey, what, this has really... You know, this has really expanded my horizon. This has really changed the way uh, I feel about stuff or I, I understand the world. It's a new way of knowing, you know, for me. Absolutely. Um, I was I was rereading The Grapes of Wrath 
And uh, I got to a passage, not the, uh, you know, there's that, um, there's the uh, Tom Joe, you know, um, sermon on uh, sermon on the Mount one that, that's later in the book. But at one point, Tom Joe is talking to his mother and he says, you know, it's a very vitriolic moment. He says, you know, if it were the law they was working with, we could take it, but it ain't the law. It, basically, he talked about the bias of these police officers yeah. and how they treated the migrants. Mm -hmm. And I used that, I put that together with a passage from Dostoevsky and a passage from James Baldwin. Yeah. And I I gave it to my class. And, you know, first, lots of them were like, what's this, you know, and I don't understand. I said, well, mm -hmm. why don't you read it and see what the guy's saying? And, you know, I tell you, a class of police officers is just like, a, it could be like a class of middle schoolers. Still, it's just like, you mm -hmm. see some bulbs come on like, oh, I get this and others don't know what this was about. But mm -hmm. uh, quite a few say, yeah, I've seen this happen to people. I've mm -hmm. seen us do this to people, Yeah, you know? And um, so backing out, so a great thing about it, about the thinking I think I brought out of the MLAs, coming away from the topic at hand, coming away from the, the immediate conflict and creating an analogy. So, you know, what did someone yeah. in, you know, yeah. 19th century Russia yeah. say about the relationship between working class people mm -hmm. and authority. Okay, now what did a working class black guy in Harlem say in the early 60s? And these, you know, Okies, so-called Okies migrants, look at these places are so dis dis disparate, but what do they all say? Yeah. You know? And then bringing it down, you have to make sure you bring it down to, so here's the brass or the brass tax. What do you get out of this? You know, mm -hmm. and, um, You'll have, I mean, I was, you know, when I first proposed to my supervisor, I was like, what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but um, you have officers just say, you know what? Yeah, I've seen this happen to people. This happens. Yeah. Um, my ethics classes too. The ethics classes have been a lot of fun because I have licensed, I use a lot of pop culture stuff. I've used clips from television shows. I've used body cam footage from actual police mm -hmm. officers. And the best thing though, was to say, here's a template. I use comic books and superheroes a lot. Um, it's a language that lots of police officers speak. And then when I pulled that all together with Immanuel Kant, and mm -hmm. we talk about deontology and teleology, mm -hmm. right? So then I have officers discussing Immanuel Kant. And, you know, Immanuel Kant as, ref as, you know, embodied in either, you know, Batman or Superman as embodied in corrupt yeah, police yeah, officers yeah, yeah, yeah. versus virtuous police officers, you know, you walk them through this ladder of understanding mm -hmm. and there's that, oh, yeah, it's I, a matter of ultimately, do I, do you cut that corner mm -hmm. to get to the ultimate goal? And that's where we run into trouble, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, basically what, if I can summarize, you know, what you're doing, it's, uh, it's explaining, you know, historically, you know, what are really you know all the social discourses that we are regulated by right i mean we right. we're never really entirely free we are we are regulated by you know social discourses and 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 we often you know act upon them and we don't know uh, mm -hmm. and um can you talk a little bit more ed about um uh but how you became a, a poet because you're also an <laughs> artist and so that when did all of this uh start because this is also like a, a you know the reason why you're here today but this is also sure. a different hat and maybe all of this you know merge merges into today merge together you know right um well i was constantly writing and as mm -hmm. a kid i just always wrote and no matter where I was developmentally, it was coming out in my writing in some way. Now I did a lot of fiction for a long time and um, I went back and found some of that from like high school and well, yeah. it was high school. Um, but um, uh, the, the poetry, I mean, I think it's in college, I started tinkering around with poetry some more, you know, and um, as time went on and I was very moved by a lot of the poetry I read in literature courses. And so I just started writing, it started, it started pushing itself to the forefront over time. Um, I found, so I was getting published in the nineties mm -hmm. already, I think. Um, and wherever, like I said, wherever I was, I was teaching at that point. Uh, I was, I lived in Baltimore then in Toledo and Baltimore and um, whatever was going on, I was just putting it into, into poetry. 
at yeah. first that was difficult with policing. I mean, whatever, whatever raw material was out there, I was processing. Yeah. I tended to find my writing when I first got into policing became very escapist. I had to kind of let go for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you download everything. And eventually I started processing policing through poetry. It was very interesting for me because it was very, the cultures, the culture that I saw as I was policing was very different than what I understood personally. And so um, this was one thing that helped me process a lot of what I was seeing. Can, can you expand on this for a little bit? Sure. Um, so when I talk about my bias, when I do my bias class, I always say, we have to look at the roots of our bias, mm -hmm. right? So I actually, I created a slide, a slide at one point. I said, okay, so this is who I am. This is how I grew up. I have a picture of the private school that I attended in Philadelphia, a cruise ship, which represented how we used to vacation, lots of books, nice house mm -hmm. with a big lawn. And I said, okay, so this is how I grew up. So what type of bias do you think I may have formulated here? What type of implicit bias? Because mm -hmm. if you would ask me, you know, well, what do you think of people that don't have degrees or didn't come from a comfortable background? Well, no, they're all the same. But then what came out as I contacted that other culture, right? Mm -hmm. When did I feel frustration? When did I see my own bigotry come forth? Things like that. Because I was working in destitute, marginalized neighborhoods. I was working with people that had really been victimized by a lot of systems. Mm -hmm. And I was in the position of authority. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's a bit of irony there because a police officer was the last thing my family thought I would become. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I don't think they were utterly shocked. I always liked, you know, things that were edgy. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to be in the U.S. Marines at one point, but, yeah. but they did not think I'd land there. But at the end of the day, um, I was trying to make sense of a culture I was trying to make sense of what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it came out as hostility and sometimes it came out as just being perplexed, you know, and my writing reflected, in many cases, it was just, it just could it be, it reflected just what I saw, things that were just shocking images. I mean, in police work, you find yourself just on a very immediate level, a very limbic system level processing conflict, processing yeah. atrocities. Yeah. Yeah, uh, two questions for you to follow up. Um, uh, can you talk more about uh, if if you want? You know, I think it's important to cut, to talk about like to talk about where we talk from, we speak from, right? And so, can you talk a little bit? You've shared a little bit. Like, can can you talk more about your upbringings, for example? Like to sure. to understand, you know, how like how you grew up, where you grew up. Both my parents came from working class backgrounds, and by the time I was born, they had multiple de degrees. They were in, uh, it, and they worked in education, both of them. Yeah. And so very comfortable uh, upper middle class situation. And- um, Where did you grow up, Ed? I grew up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, grew up in, I grew up in Philadelphia. I went to the, to the Penn Charter School there. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's funny, I, you know, I remember talking to my mom about wanting to go into law enforcement right after 9-11 and she said, to, to do what? I mean, it was like, this was not, not, this was not the trajectory you were supposed to take, you know? Um, yeah. So there were feelings of, you know, I wasn't honoring a culture of upward mobility and I wasn't, I see. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't honoring the type of culture from which I came. And I, you know, I, but also I came from a culture of free thinking, I think in public yeah. service, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, it definitely became very lucid to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I mean, um, when I not, not just worked in the neighborhoods, but talked to people. And a big thing that was really good for me was I walked foot. In any case, it's something I talk about with my um, students. Um, because motorized patrol can keep you very isolated. You know, answer a call, get yeah. back in the car and go. But when I found myself walking, I'm talking to people and understanding, you know, here's, you know, there's synergy here. Here's where we're divergent, you know but there's a shared humanity, but it, it took, you know, it was a, a process for me. Mm -hmm. It really was. I mean, um, yeah. And, I, and, hmm? and, and, and so uh, you alluded to that a little bit before, but why police officer? Like, how did that come about? Like how, why did you decide to become a, a police officer since that was not really uh, inscribed in, in like your social uh, uh, trajectory, you know? So hence your mother's, you know, reaction, why? <laughs> right. Um, 
I tried to be in the military when I was in college. I was naval mm-hmm. ROTC. I injured my back mm-hmm. uh, pretty badly at officers' candidate school. You see, I you know I cranked my head back and forth like this. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. mm-hmm. So uh, I couldn't do that. I went into academics. I was a teacher for a while, and like I said, my first what was supposed to be my first day at Hopkins was 9/11, 2001. And um, so I resolved that you know at this point I said I'm I'm feeling stronger I'm feeling better I you know I want to take on that role and it's funny because I was in academics and this was I wanted to do something that was hands on that was practical and existed in the the re, you know yeah. I love the world of ideas and I wanted to see how they were applied in real life and I thought that you know I wanted to be part of the mission mm-hmm. I always liked that idea mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so I resolved to uh, but I, I decided police officer was something very practical and real and close to home. I looked at the secret service and different things, but I thought, you know, this looks like something really real and grounded and practical and mm-hmm. challenging. And yeah. Um, yeah. And so in, in the end, really, you're really, uh, you're, you're really doing uh, a little bit of both, I would say, you know, I mean, because mm, they, I mean, of course it's very practical to be a, a, a police officer, but I mean, you've continued with your, with your studies and you are now also a, a published poet. So uh, if you uh, don't mind, let's, let's switch to the book. Let's talk about the sure. book. Um, and uh, uh, can you, so you've written several, um, uh, several books of poetry. Uh, mm-hmm. that have been published. Um, can you talk uh, about, can you talk more about how this one came about? You know, I did a, uh, back in October last year, mm-hmm. I did a writer's residency down in Florida. It's very interesting. Yes. I was down in, in, in Florida, which ultimately became an epicenter, you know, but um, so I wrote like about seven poems in seven days and brought them back. And uh, it was during the, um, it was really during the quarantine that I started to actually pull yeah. this together and write more and write more and write more mm-hmm. and start to refine it. So that's where I really think it found its, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. you know, it found its, its fruition. So you, you you started writing this 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 one book uh, uh, in March of last year. Is that what what happened? The this as yeah. it is as I yeah. started. I mean, there are lots of pieces in here that yeah, it was around March. Yeah. That I started. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so this is really a book of, as I mentioned, you know, in the introduction of, uh, of, of the COVID epidemic uh, of mm-hmm. uh, social unrest. So, what are what are the themes? Can you talk more about like the themes in this book? Sure. I mean, some of the poems, some of the poems um, are about cultural isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of them are about schism and conflict. Yeah. Uh, one culture butting up against another. Uh, one culture trying to make sense of another or judging another, um, creating systems in which the other is supposed to function. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's one of the big themes because it's funny, you know, as I was writing a lot of the stuff, I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah. As, yeah. These, as these poems kind of push themselves out, I was starting to notice, okay, this is what's going on with me right now. Yeah. Okay, you know. Yeah. Um, I think there's and, and, a, hmm? and uh, yeah, you wanted to say. Go ahead. No, I just, I just think um, as I, as I'm kind of thumbing through, I can see there's always the issue of looking at the other. There's often mm-hmm. the issue of looking at the other. Um, yeah. You know, often the issue, and and this is why I think, and I think Maxine Hong Kingston used this term. Uh, Woman warrior. She talked about ghosts a lot, mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. there were black ghosts and white ghosts, and um, they were, you know the intangible other. And I think ghosts have always played a big role in my writing. Um, so I realized this was a slip into magical realism too for me. And I think that really helped put forth. And once again, it's like a lot of this was like, I'm, I'm writing along and thinking I'm gonna go back later. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, like the back cover also says that it's, it's, uh, it's about moments of fission and fusion. And this is exactly how I felt when I read the book. Can you talk oh. a little bit more about this too? Yeah, I mean, when, when you have contact, right, right with, that, with that other, yeah. okay? So there's, there's that moment, I mean, I, uh, there's a moment of shared humanity of some sort. And at the same time, there could be a matter of mm-hmm. what system do you inhabit? Which system do I inhabit? Mm-hmm. You know, um, what are your expectations from my system? And you're, you know, uh, I, I um, a book that I read 
in a women's studies course back in undergrad that I, I go back to time and time again, uh, this bridge called My Back, uh, edited by Gloria Anzaldua. And um, one of the main issues, in the main issue in that book, that anthology was that you had these women of color who were drawn together with white women in their feminist struggle, but then found themselves found efficient when they were still parts of different systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was them writing this anthology saying, this is why we're, we can't seem to form community with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're, so, they're, yeah, a very common history, right, in all all activist movement. I mean, the the LGBT movement also, you know, uh, uh, parted ways, you know, because African Americans didn't really see eye to eye with, you know, their white counterparts. You know, the struggle against AIDS too. I mean, it, it it's 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 actually a pretty yeah. So it's it's always intersectionality is very important, right? This right, is what you're right. saying. I've got yeah, I've yeah. got it striking that after after Stonewall, Stonewall didn't just solidify everything it was like okay there's this moment of a common enemy but yeah. after that when well, we inhabit different worlds and we inhabit different economic systems and yeah, yeah 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 absolutely and and let's never forget also that stonewall you know was started by by african-american gay men i mean you know right. so uh yeah and so um uh ed you wanted to read a, a couple of poems you, we may sure. have time for two um okay. please pick one and Tell us, you know, maybe uh, what the poem is about also. Okay, so this is one I drew very, this is one I drew directly from an incident with policing. Yeah. Um, that I, um, it was my introduction to the con, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read through this first, you know. And, and uh, which one are you reading? Uh, this is uh, Rapture of the Fishman. I'll show the fishman. Uh, and so, so uh, this five. is on page, uh, yeah, five. this is on page five for mm -hmm. uh, people who have the book. Yeah, please okay. go. The fishman kicked up his legs that morning. He slapped his hands on the concrete and he called out, chirping and gurgling with a voice that cracked like glass and dry wooden splinters. The fishman tried to swim in midair that day, tried to swim on dry land, tried to swim through the congregation of jobless white t-shirts. He bashed his head down on the concrete of McMeckin Street and let the red flowers spread across the sidewalk. The fishman danced as though he'd been hauled out of the sea and onto the deck of a schooner, christened the street with the foam and the spit welled out of, his, of him after he jammed a speed ball into the big vein of his right leg. He christened the street with his blood and his spit until a blonde medic close to the end of her shift came with naloxone to stick up his nose and wash him free of his holy ghost. Yeah. And um, that uh, came to me, literally I pulled up on what I thought was a grand mal seizure yeah. and um, put out a call on my radio and then realized, no, this is not a seizure. He had taken, a speedball, which is mm -hmm. a very strong stimulant and a very strong depressant at the same mm -hmm. time. And so the person ends up in this fugue state where they're completely relaxed from one, but doing like literally gymnastics mm -hmm. um, from the other. And, you know, you can stand outside of that and say, well, I'm not doing that. Oh, look, what type mm -hmm. of lifestyle do you lead? But think what type of pain do you have to be in? Mm -hmm. you know yeah, where yeah. am i inextricably uh, drawn to you mm -hmm. that you know i could be in that much pain to want to yeah. be torn in half like this you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it took me a while to get to that um it took me a while to get to that because often dealing with people often dealing with people with um addiction mm -hmm. it can be very easy to become judge judgmental and look at the at the affect and look at the presentation and say, oh my gosh. Yeah, but to right. remember, and I often say to my recruits, but imagine the type of pain you'd have to be in to live yeah. this, you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and, and 
and also it's also worth reminding for um, you know all of our audience here that you know drug addiction is very real and that this is a medical condition that needs to right. be treated and that it it needs not to be judged um so yeah it's a it's a beautiful i, I love that line about the splinters uh and i mean it's almost as if we feel you know the splinters you know crackling it's uh it's a uh, it's beautiful would you mind reading another one sure i'll um so with this uh, little bit of magical realism here. Um, to be trussed up and, and waiting, this is on page two. Okay. Right. They will slaughter the goat when he comes back from the mountain. They have tethered it to the, to the tree and they drink rum through the passing time as they wait for him to wind his way back down the dirt road. They smoke the tobacco that he gave them before he picked up a twisted branch to use as a walking stick and said that he would be back soon. Just a little walk, then I will come back for the meat. So now that he has met the conquistador who sits forlorn in heavy armor at the foot of a shattered castle, and the slave who still limps from cutting off the cuffs on the day of his, his, his escape, he comes down and they gather their knives. They will collect the meat and pay, he'll collect the meat and pay them, he has explained, but he must see the severed head. Times are hard here, and he wants to know that they have not tried to sell him the carcass of a withered dog from the junkyard on the other side of the road. Uh, explain for the audience. <laughs> so, like I said, I've had I've often had I've had a fascination with magical realism uh, in Latin American literature, uh -huh. and. and a fascination with Latin America as well, because if there's any place that shows fusion and vision and, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Precisely, you know, yeah, precisely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's interesting for me too, because I, I found out, um, and I, I wish I could remember exactly how the story went, but I was filling out a medical form, I think sometime in my twenties, like maybe thirties and mentioned it to my mother and um, he said, where it says ethnicity, you might want to put Hispanic or Latino. And I said, why? Mm -hmm. And there's a whole hidden history that my family had mm -hmm. as that my grandfather, George, I mean, he was actually Jorge and came from Cuba and his middle name was Manuel. And so all these pieces are coming together. I'm like, well, what? So there are, and first it was just like, well, I don't, get it but you know and then as I listened and I thought well there are the ghosts again right oh yeah ghosts. yeah yeah okay yeah mm -hmm. right you know so there were the ghosts that caused the the transition of culture and there are the ghosts that still linger um because there always has to be this contrivance of make sure not to slip back into this identity we've gotten rid of so that has that's a thread that's woven its way through a lot of my, my writing. So the idea of the ghosts and the history that you can't really avoid and um, how that manifests itself in the way we live now, you know, uh, where we live and how we live. And even if you don't see or recognize that this poltergeist is moving things around. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 in many ways, like those ghosts, I mean, like it's, uh, it really goes back also to like the social discourses maybe that you were talking earlier. Like I mm -hmm. see a little, uh, a little, uh, uh, oh, sure. Link here. What are you, who are your influences? Like who are the uh, the poets that you review? I mean, as you can see, I wanted to sit in this in this corner of my apartment today because there's a little picture of Langston Hughes right there. I see. And yes. So, I was uh, yeah, earlier. yeah. Yes. And so Langston Hughes is 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 watching over us today. Uh, <laughs> but uh, who are your um, uh, your 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 idols? Your 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 the people that you look up to uh, in, in, in poetry literature? You know, it is so such a diverse group. Um, Langston Hughes is, is one, in fact, I prefer yeah. him as a playwright uh, versus yeah, 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 a, a yeah, poet. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah, his, yeah, yeah. his yeah, yeah. plays. Uh, Carson McCullers mm -hmm. um, looms large. I've, I started reading her back when I was about 16 or 17 and mm -hmm. she just you know, enmeshed herself in me. Uh, Joseph Conrad, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ernest Hemingway. We we have we have some issues when it comes to his misogynistic, um, you know, sure. issues. But a lot his ter his turn of phrase um, yeah. is tremendous. Um, 
I think that James James Baldwin is yeah. one. He I brought him out. I use him a lot. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, w w what book by James Baldwin would you so recommend to somebody who I doesn't love... know James Baldwin? Right. Um, so, and once again, the, the, the trajectory of his life. I mean, from mm -hmm. Harlem to his being an expatriate in France, mm -hmm. um, being openly gay when this was not something that he was he was in the artistic world so i guess you know he was in a yeah you know a a social com compartment where that was expected but um i love giovanni's room yeah um i love giovanni's room that was that's one of my favorites uh the fire next time which is essays do you do you do you have uh, any um uh like contemporary poet that you that you particularly like uh i i i don't know if you know him i don't know if you know his poetry but i i i very much like the book of um the guy who won um uh, the pulitzer for poetry uh this past year jericho brown i'm not sure you know about him but he's written like the tradition like i see there's a lot of uh a lot of commonalities actually between your work and his work about really? you know okay. the gifts miss and uh, <laughs> fusion uh, where yeah but because i mean it always seems you know when i talk to students and maybe you maybe you would disagree with that but that um you know poetry is a thing of the past like it's not something that we do now right. and i'm always like no of course not poetry <laughs> is very much alive uh you know i mean you're you're living proof of that but <laughs> anybody that you that you would recommend to you know, uh, so who doesn't know? Oh yeah, James no, Heaney. No. Um, I'm getting back. I've I've gone back and forth with uh, district and district and, and circle, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm getting yeah. back into that. I've actually been listening, listening to and reading some of Margaret Atwood's poetry. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are two that that stick yeah. out right away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good choices. Yeah, and and um, uh, let's let's branch out to the last segment here because we, yes. uh, we have only twenty minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, so very wide question here for you, Ed. I mean, this is really a book that was written during the COVID epidemic, during you know the social unrest after mm -hmm. the the death of George Floyd, the trials coming up and, and next yes. week. Yes. Um, but how? how did you live that how how did that influence this work you know what did you see you know change in baltimore wow you know um so i was involved in the 2015 you know some say riots some say yeah. uprising in baltimore but can i was you, involved in you, that can you give the the background for oh sure um so audience? this is when you had the death of freddie gray while okay. in police mm -hmm. custody mm -hmm. and um i remember getting the the call, you know, like my supervisor, I was training officers and he said, get your yeah. gear. You've got to get down to the courthouse. There's a yes. protest going on. Yeah. And um, it went from a protest, you know, people yelling and, you know, it's, you know, it's the usual first amendment thing we have. You line up and wait and mm -hmm. listen and people are yelling to, we heard something, we heard a signal 13 come out. And that means officer. Now I'm talking from my perspective. There are people all over the city course, with different yeah. perspectives on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we ended up going up to Camden Yards. And I just remember we were in a van, turned the corner. And I remember seeing a cooler come flying through the air. Just debris was flying. And yeah. so it was nothing but hostility. I mean, it was, it was very raw and very immediate. And, you know, a bit of a, of a brawl and, and, I was there when the CBS was burned. Um, mm -hmm. And so when we heard protest, when we heard people coming out, I think a lot of us said, oh my gosh, here we go again. Uh, once again, people had different experiences on different days at different places and times. For me, I had some pretty good conversations with people. Um, yeah. we, were, we were prepared, we were geared up, we knew what to do. But I found that for one thing, a lot of officers saw that image and they were horrified. And I can I can honestly say, you know, very hardcore, you know, that, that, warrior, that the image. images of, of, of George Floyd. George and Floyd, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. was thinking, what, what is what is that guy doing? What is going on? What's he doing? He's killing that guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I even spoke to officers in other countries and they were mm -hmm. like, what's what is this? Yeah. And so there was less of a fee, you know. I think there was there was more of a connection of like you know, I can see why you're protesting. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you mean do you mean from the side of your colleagues that who, who yeah, are like, oh, I, think, I totally understand why people? Yeah, I think yeah, I think there were more. You know, I think there was there was less of a feel. I mean, I think there was more of a feeling of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's some outrage here, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. and I, I had some good conversations. I know we we did have some violence. We did have a little bit. I mean, it was when you compare it to what happened in 2015 and what could have happened. I was very mm -hmm. proud of, of 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 Baltimore. Um, yeah, it really was, and uh, I really feel like this is a point of departure for law enforcement, which I think is great. I think as much as we have to have the tools of warriors in many cases mm -hmm. we have to be humanists and we have to be uh, affirming of democracy and i and i think that that's a stronger i think there's a strong impetus towards that i mean yeah, it's, yeah. it's going to be a battle but yeah and so do, uh, question to you you know um uh, i remember very vividly also myself uh, the demonstration you know, after after uh, the death of george floyd here in dc um and 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 you know to provide some context to people who might not listen who are listening to us but may not be living in the us right now mm -hmm. it was also you know as you remember right at the end of I don't want to say you know the lockdown, but it was it, we had a form of lockdown here because of of, of COVID. And um, uh, how did you think all of this, you know, really uh, also impacted you know the demonstration? It seems to me that those demonstrations in June uh, were much more than just about uh, Black Lives Matter, racial justice, mm -hmm. social justice. It seems like there were so many movements, you know, coming together uh, to demand just more justice. I mean, it, it was the very first time that I had seen, you know, here in DC, uh, uh, a, a good amount of white people demonstrate demonstrating in the streets for Black Lives Matter, you know, yeah. um, which, which of course, you know, testify to the necessity of the movement, but also I think to me, um, shows that people were um, uh, demonstrating for much for something that was much bigger than that, you know, um, what what's your reading of the situation? You know, it's um, it reminded me of you know that you, you hear about these cases during the the fifties and sixties, the civil rights movement, yeah. where something so atrocious took place yeah. that it was like this wake up call. Um, there was a sergeant back in like the late forties who was blinded. Uh, he was he just got back from World War Two, and he a southern sheriff put out both of his eyes with his nightstick, mm -hmm. the butt of his nightstick. And Harry S. Truman heard about it and he said, I didn't know it was this bad. Mm -hmm. um, I think there were moments like that where it was not just a matter of we want to see the police do different things. I think it was, and, I, and the first thing I thought as you were asking that question was how they tore down the Statue of Columbus here in, ba in Baltimore through yeah. it in the harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that there's a, a systematic status quo that, that what you saw with George Floyd was just systemic of a, of a, of a system, of a status quo that is right. all about, yeah. is very much based in racism and in, in injustice. And so, yeah, I, I do think that. Yeah, and, 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 and uh, I, I, so b because I'm originally from France, you know, I was talking a lot to the French media about this, you know, and so their lens was very much, um, uh, on the violence, you know, and so it's always tricky, you know, to talk about this because I mean, there's a, a lot of invisible violence that's, you know, uh, uh, everywhere in the world, right? Yeah. Um, uh, can you, can you, you know, can you maybe explain your vision? You know, how do you understand that? You know, I mean, like the different forms of violence that you, oh my gosh, that yeah. you see, you know, because it's it, and also maybe moving, you know, of course, for uh, beyond, you know, just. Um, uh, physical violence which of course I absolutely condemn, you know and yeah mm -hmm. now, especially coming from the point of view of a law enforcement officer and yeah, yeah, figure yeah. um mm -hmm. something as simple as the way you speak to someone absolutely mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. as simple as the language that you use or the affect that you take can tell that person whether yeah. you know what we're in a shared democracy yeah. and a shared humanity You've transgressed the law and I'm taking you in, but that's all it is versus there's a certain station you have in society and I'm going to make mm -hmm. sure you keep, I keep it there. So keep breaking the law because that's going to help me yeah. crush you. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm coming very specifically from the point of view of having, you know, I had to become sensitive to, you know, there are systems that are at work here 
And I mean, I, I actually heard, you know, I, I heard someone say once on the street to an officer, you don't have to worry about me. I'm a good N word. And he backed up. And I thought that was bizarre. And, and um, but yeah. for him, it was like, I have to access this system somehow to keep myself safe. And so if, if kowtowing like this does it for this officer, then I'll do that. And, uh, you know, the officer was rather put off too, or at least he, you know, he said to me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at the end of the day, the way we speak to one another, the way we regard one another, mm -hmm. um, the, the- Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, what the, the, great, the great French social, sociologist, uh, Pierre Bourdieu would, would call the habitus. That is to mm -hmm. say, the way you present yourself to somebody, it can be a form of violence. You know, there's a way to say, what's your name? What's your name? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's That's just, very it's, well put. Yeah. You know, you know, there's a way, you know, for example, in, 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 in languages where there is, you know, a, a formal you and, and an informal you, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you don't use, you know, the informal you to somebody that you don't know, you know, where, you know, a lot of police officers, for example, in, in France, you know, are arresting young people and, and automatically using, uh, the formal you, you know, so, um, uh, yeah, all of this is, uh, is very, um, is, 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 is very important, you know, so, uh, we have a couple of questions, uh, Ed, um, uh, last question for you, uh, uh what do you see happening like this? It's always hard to make predictions, uh, but I, I have the feeling that we are in the U.S. at like a turning point. That twenty twenty oh, yeah. was really a turning yes. point. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I don't think there's really going back. You know, there's not a lot of. Yeah. Either there's not a lot of you know. Well, back to things as usual. I mean, it's like. Yeah. And, the, and Ed, also, if you can weave that, uh, because we haven't talked about this, but. Um, your experience also um, uh, of you know the COVID epidemic in, in, in Baltimore? Sure. Yeah. I think because this was so, so very writ large, um, yeah. so the demands and expectations being made on law enforcement in terms of humanism are writ large. And mm -hmm. the fact that COVID befell certain populations but in others and was perceived so differently from one school of thought versus another was writ large. And yeah. so um, I think in general, in the United States and the Western world, we're at a turning point where we have to say, you know, yeah, who, yeah. who are we now? I mean, law enforcement, definitely. It's a matter of, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, for us, we've said, you know, we, we don't do zero tolerance policing. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. just don't. Mm -hmm. And we are going to do the least intrusive thing possible when we deal with, with people. We're going to fight mm -hmm. crime and we're going to do it in a humanistic way. Mm -hmm. And we're, re we're learning to walk again mm -hmm. um, in this agency. Um, now, obviously, and, and how, how do you interpret, you know, all the movements also that are, um, I would say, congregating together, you know, in, in American society at large, you know, to me, it really seemed, I don't know if you agree with that, and I don't know what you saw also in Baltimore, um, but really over the summer, you know, it, it seemed to me that there were really a lot of people from uh, all walks of lives really yes. coming together, uh, demanding justice. You know, when we talk about violence, to me, it was very uh, telling uh, here in Washington D.C. that, for example, the the the, the businesses that were uh, hit or 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 violated by by the protesters were not your mom and pop businesses. You know, it was really the banks. It was, mm. uh, you know, it was all the symbols of um, of a neoliberal, you know, capitalistic society. You know, do you see something along those lines, like uh, uh, some some sort of like consciousness that um, the system at large, you know, let's say, you know, may, I don't know if you want to call it capitalistic society, you know, cannot really truly work, you know, in the end. Do you see that? I think it's a, I think a, I think consciousness was a good, a good way to put it. I think it's a call to consciousness and thus for responsibility. Yeah. Um, so can we have responsible capitalism? Can we have responsible policing? You mm -hmm. know, do we have to rewrite the thesis of the Western world to say, and by the way, remember we have a humanist background, we have human spaces. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I did a class on uh, enlightenment philosophy as reflected in police mm -hmm. reform yeah. um, and that ideas of humanism and the ideas of the enlightenment 
are very basic to who we're supposed to be. And maybe mm-hmm, we've lost mm-hmm. some of that. We've lost some ideas about democracy mm-hmm, and about mm-hmm. our trajectory as a uh, society. So yeah, and I think that this this may be, maybe, you know, we might be overcompensating in some ways, but I think yeah, in general, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think this might be the thing to draw us back to center. Yeah, I, I think it's important to really touch briefly. Uh, I mean, we, we could talk another hour together, but sure. uh, about, um, how did you experience the the COVID epidemic in Baltimore? What did you see? I mean, there was, of course, this this pandemic was absolutely also was revealing, you know, a lot of the structural inequalities in America. I mean, sure. it's predominantly poor people that died, right? So, right. Um, how did you how did you experience that? Well, <laughs> the first thing have you asked that? The first thing uh, I, I can think of is driving. I'm essential, so I'm driving to work mm-hmm. on an empty highway. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, outfitting officers with gas masks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up going on special patrols. Um, we called them COVID patrols, but I in, we would I went to areas that had like shopping centers, usually yeah. in impoverished areas, and uh, it was striking to me because there's kind of a malaise that I saw in some cases where it was like groups of people that just didn't seem to really absorb what was going on you know, and others did but mm-hmm. there you know and, and um there's a sense of fear i mean there is intense palpable fear in yeah. some cases uh so it was a lot of what i'd seen already in some of these neighborhoods um mm-hmm. but you know there's never just one dynamic i mean you had groups of people that i don't know were like kind of threw up their hands and others that said, you know, officer, I'm really scared. I really don't want to get this disease. Who's mm-hmm. going to take care of me if I do, mm-hmm. you know? And what was interesting for me was I didn't really, it wasn't, police officers often think about, I'm about going into a situation, have a solution. And obviously mm-hmm. there's nothing I could really do about COVID. And so I was mm-hmm. like, well, let's make sure we distance folks, mm-hmm. you know, and I was like, you should be distance. And I remember kind of giving people pep talks, you know, like, yeah. you know, come on, we're from Baltimore, you know, we can handle this. Yeah, I know, I know, you know, and it was, so I really had, it's funny for me, there was kind of a feeling of like a bit of community, like, you know, we can get through this, but yeah, it was particulate, you know, for every group like that, there was a, someone else that just seemed to kind of throw it up their hands, you know, um, but generally palpable fear, there really was. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Fear, uh, fear of, 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 of the disease, of the social consequences, the economic all insert, of all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. all of that. And we have a few questions from the audience that I want to share with you. Uh, uh, Lena is asking, uh, are your classes mandatory for all new recruits? Yes. Yes, Yes, absolutely. Um, And she's also asking, um, have you faced a lot of pushback within the thin blue line culture in teaching ethics from the humanistic perspective? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, I have. Um, I um, yeah, I mean, I had some, and once again, you know, you, you can't draw, you know, big circle there, but I mean, I've had some, in, in every class, there's someone who says, you know, okay, let me give this a try. Let me see what he's trying to say here. Yeah. And we get some great conversations. And I've had many people that kind of, you know, they do the cop, you know, but yeah, um, I've had some, you know, say, well, this, this is a waste of time. And the person next to him might yeah. say, well, listen to, listen to what he's saying, man. This is, this is, yeah. 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 And we've had some great, but yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I had someone take a pitch, a paper with some quotes by Kant on it and say, I don't care if he's dead. You know? yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. And uh, we, uh, so uh, please ask your question to, to Ed, I'll be relaying them. Uh, Travis asks, uh, Ed, has James Baldwin's candor regarding prejudice influenced your writing? You know, ultimately it has, um, you know, he's, uh, yes, uh, it, it came out in my, my voice, my tone, but yeah, he was very, I love how very straightforward he was about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, especially when he talked about law enforcement, when he talked about how angry he was at police officers and how, because everything was straightforward and was very present in his world. Um, it was brutal. Yeah. And yeah, he was yeah. brutalized. So yes, it, I think it, I think it, it really has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, well, thank you so much, Ed. Uh, one last question for you. We have two minutes. Uh, yeah. What's next here? Uh, you have just published this book that was just released a couple of weeks ago. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that you're going to be uh, talking about the books uh, um, uh, for a while. Do you have something um, uh, that's cooking right now? Another book oh, of sure. poetry? Yeah, okay. I'm always, I have a little notebook with me all the time. I'm yeah. always writing. Yeah. And um, I've got a much longer piece that I've, I've been writing for a while now. So still writing away and um I have a pile of books which i'm going to read this this year <laughs> okay okay great yeah, great definitely. okay so uh with that being said i just want to thank you for sharing an hour with thank me tonight. you so it much. was a pleasure to have you uh, i've loved having this conversation i'm sure that the audience loved it too ed thank you so much um thank have you. a wonderful night and everybody uh in in the audience have a wonderful night too thank you so much bye thank you very much take care